kind of run through this really quickly. Call for Code is a, a huge endeavor which really seeks to, you know, align technology with some of society's most pressing issues, whether it's around natural disasters, climate change, COVID-19, which has clearly been affecting us for, you know, the past, you know, I think about like year and a half and probably, you know, um, in a couple more years. Um, and then Call for Code for Racial Justice, which originated as, you know, uh, a spot challenge. So something that's really, you know, re requires an immediate response um, you know, through Call for Code. Um, and But it has since evolved since then. Uh, and Call for Code was really originated and founded by David Clark Haas. And, you know, as kind of like the technology gurus, IBM is really helping to take these solutions to the forefront and connecting them with the communities that really need it. So kind of how we got here, uh, this was actually done in partnership with Red Hat. Uh, where we were able to, you know, have 500 volunteers across the globe contributing to this project. Last year, June um, Teamth is when it kicked off of 2020. Um, and since then, you know, we've been able to really focus on using open source um, technologies to help build up the solutions. Um, and then even if we're talking about uh, being able to continue to have the right type of supports, being able to have uh, developers access, you know, IBM technology, other open source um, technology in order to refine and continue to build out um, these solutions for our potential partners who want to use these as their ways of working. And, you know, I've also just listed, you know, other types of resources and, um, you know, impact that we've had, you know, internally in the company and what we're also looking to do uh, externally. So kind of giving perspective on where we are today, there are lots more happening. We'd love to share a little bit more of that um, within our channel, uh, and we will share a little bit more about that towards the end. But, you know, providing additional context into Call for Code for Racial Justice, again, that was originally a spot challenge. Uh, it was in response to, you know, some of the violence that we were seeing specifically against um, Black people with, you know, uh, you know police over-policing um, and IBMers really wanted to have a vehicle to express their frustration. Um, and that really capitalized on how are we able to use the skill sets that we have right now in order to have this um, vision of you know, accessibility, um, you know, humanity, uh, and um, opportunities within you know, communities that really need it. Um, and with the lens that systemic racism sometimes really, you know, is ingrained in a lot of the systems that uh, exist to, you know, serve people. So with that lens, we develop these three pillars wherein all of our solutions fall in right now. Um, police and judicial reform and accountability, diverse representation, and policy and legislation reform. And again, you know, five-fifths voter. Um, that we're, you know, diving into today falls under, you know, the policy and legislation reform um, pillar. So now going into a little bit of the solution, I'm not going to talk as much. I'm just kind of like setting the groundwork for the amazing team that worked on this project to, you know, really launch it off, to share with you how we got here um, and, you know, what's, you know, coming forward and how folks can get involved. Um, wanted to, you know, just give a little bit of context because, again, we're dealing with a little more global audience. Wanted to, you know, set the stage on how does policy and legislation work within the U.S., providing, you know, some, you know, kind of simple understanding of where uh, we are coming from and we want voters to, you know, share their voices around policy and this type of work. So legislation, of course, being the proposed law that um, would, you know, essentially become law, um, law of the land, and it's passed by a legislator. So folks that you actually vote for to get into those positions. And then we have our executive branch, which signs it um, into law. And then policy, which are, you know, are the actions and standards um, set by that executive branch. Uh, and then we are able to, you know, follow that law. So that's really like the flow that we end up, you know, going with here in the States. But what really ends up happening is that the executive branch, um, as well as, you know, the legislator are folks that we are able to affect them being there. So uh, when we're looking at why is this important from a voting standpoint, it's like if I can't even vote for the folks who are passing laws, regulations, and legislation in the country or even in my state, then I'm not able to, you know, uh, articulate, you know, what my desires and what my wills are. And it, you know, can really throw balance off um, for communities that may be vulnerable. And then next slide. So 
in expanding for the solution, what could policy and legislation reform look like um, from a kind of the lens of, you know, the call for co-operational justice and, you know, looking at five fifths voter is like, how can we really explore technology um, to analyze, inform and develop policies um, around, you know, in areas that are important to us um, in a meaningful way? And Five Fifths Voter really is focused on how can we inform people of the ways in which they can start to affect change through their voice, through their vote, uh, for the um, you know industries that will be affecting them. Um, and it really is like you know power is in the hands of the voter because you determine or you have a really really strong influence uh, on what legislators are creating um, and passing because uh, you know that's your right as you know a voter and being able to say if something is going to affect you positively or negatively being able to share that through your vote. Um, and ultimately, we really want to focus on ensuring that citizens, specifically, you know, folks who have typically been disenfranchised um, from voting, and we're going to share a little bit more about that for them in the presentation, just like on the timeline of, you know, where voter suppression and oppression has happened and why we really want to focus on those groups, because accessibility has not really caught up to speed um, for them. And so this solution is really going to focus on, you know, why they should vote and how to vote through our um, accessible tool. Um, and through last kind of, you know, statement that I'm going to say uh, before handing this off to Alexandria is that, you know, the problem that Five Face Voters is really addressing is that voting can be impossible and challenge or challenging due to, you know, burdensome local processes, change in requirements to regulations and lack of information to voters. Uh, and, you know, there are also roadblocks that exist when it talks about not being able to qualify to vote when you have voter purging that happens unbeknownst to you. You find out that you're not registered or that, you know, um, you have to register because you moved. Um, you don't have the correct form of ID. Uh, you have to, um, you know, you've missed deadlines for registering. There are just, you know, countless roadblocks um, that really exist around voters who, um, are either super busy, you know, burdened with, you know, some of the more systemic issues that we're seeing within communities of color. Um, I really wanted to drive home that awareness is sometimes, you know, kind of the one of the biggest issues as well, where if there are changes, they may not be the community that first hears about it, or having access or knowing where to go to find that information about it is, um, is, is a problem. Um, and then we're talking about even accessibility for people who are differently abled. Um, uh, how can we ensure that they are still able to articulate themselves and have uh, a way to vote, um, you know, in any election that they choose to participate in? So hoping that this kind of gives you a scope of what um, we're talking about today. We're going to dive, you know, again into the context of Five Fifths Voter, getting into, you know, some of the more technical components and then seeing ways for you all to get involved. So with that, I'm going to play this quick video and hopefully the audio and everything works. Is it working? And is not working. Let's see. Give me a moment so I can pull up this video because I think it's really going to help uh, spearhead what it is that we're talking about um, and an introduction to the solution. Take your time. No rush. <laughs> so let's go here and we can go and play. All right. We can't hear this, so give me a minute. I'll resume share. So this is the video. Can, wait, can it's you hear it? A minority, yeah. legally disabled, okay. elderly, or convicted of a felony. Your voice matters. So when you are prevented from knowing how to get information to express your whole vote, the Five Fifths Voter Tool is designed to help fill that gap and put the power back in your hands. A group of diverse IBMers came together and created an open source solution that voters can access through a responsive website design. Check your voting status, find your polling location, get connected to valuable and reliable resources like transportation and child care options on election day. 
The Podcast Builder Starter Kit introduces a cognitive solution built on IBM Cloud with OpenShift using Watson Tone Analyzer, Watson Natural Language, as well as Carbon Design Open Source Technology with custom components created in Vue.js, Express.js, and Python. With additional strong API integrations, more reliable resources, and a robust database, Bypass Builder can become the go-to voter hub for once marginalized voters. With your help, together, we can expand and grow the Fifth Voter Platform. Take a peek, see where we're going, and partner with us to complete Fifth Voter. When this happens, when you join us, together, we can help speed up full voices being heard and counted in this nation. Okay. That's awesome. Is that today or tomorrow? Okay. okay. Um, all right, uh, and so thanks uh, for everyone who sat down to watch this, and I'll go ahead and um, kick this off to Alexandria to, you know, introduce, you know, some of the team. I know everyone is on the call. You see a lot of faces on this screen, um, but definitely wanted to give a, a platform for the folks who are here with us today um, to share, you know, what they do in their full-time um, role, as well as, you know, their position and, you know, what they were able to accomplish within the team. So kicking it off to you, Alexandria. Hey, everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, well, I just, um, it's it's actually really heartwarming because it's almost exactly a year ago, we had one of our first um, uh, meetings, uh, solution meetings as part of this program. And, you know, one of the great things about our team that that I really felt, I think that we all uh, can, can say is that, uh, the way that we're constructed, the way that we have so many different backgrounds on our team, so many different life experiences, so many different cultures, uh, viewpoints, understanding, skill sets. I think that that is a key part of why the solution can be so effective is because it's by the people and for the people. Um, because of the experiences that we've all had, we can dig from you know those those experiences and relationships and be able to cater to the end user and connect with the end user. And that's, uh, it's something beautiful because it's all different types of people and that's what we ultimately would like to be able to reach. And we came together for the, for the with the motivation of tackling the systemic racism issue. So uh, that's something that I just found to be very touching. And um, a year later, we can say that it's actually starting to get into the hands of people to be able to improve their lives. Um, I'm not sure who else is on that might want to. Uh, yeah, so we wanted to just, you know, say like, what do you do in your full-time job? Just, you know, so people can understand that this is a, a project that a lot of um, uh, folks on the call have done outside of their, you know, kind of scope of work just to show that, you know, folks are really passionate about that. So if you can share with folks uh, what you're doing outside of um, this work and just kind of giving uh, a little bit of context so you can introduce other folks. Yeah, sorry, I I uh, thought that it had said on there, but um, yeah. So in my day job, I actually just uh, got promoted to another role, but I uh, moved over to the services department. So my focus is in uh, data and artificial intelligence for expert labs. Um, I'm a sales principal, and so I oversee. I pretty much have my um, organization of clients and oversee them and. Uh, deliver the services uh, that we have around data and AI and automation. And I find it to be actually really applicable in this project because um, we definitely want to be able to leverage some of those tools to be able to connect with uh, users as much as we possibly can. And for everybody else on the team, um, you know, it, from, it's a, there are a myriad of backgrounds uh, that, that we all have. Um, but I was a, a project um, manager on the team, um, and you know others have very, um, very demanding jobs as well. But again, it just shows the passion and connectivity that we had in being a part of this um, this program. And it was actually a very accelerated, so we really had to work together, and the respect that that we all had for each other and each other's times, and even for those that were overseas that came. Um, on board really spoke a lot to the integrity of the group of people that that were part of this project. Absolutely. So I'll let the um, kind of quickly do a round of, of folks who are on the call to just do a quick introduction um, and saying like what your full time job is and then you know what you contributed, um, you know, towards the project and then we can uh, move forward. 
Not all at once. Don't yeah, I'll start. <laughs> um, my name is Joe Mitchell. I'm a, I, I work at IBM as the architect for a product called IBM Developer for ZOS, um, where my primary job is working on programming in Java, Eclipse, and mainframe programming languages, whether that's Golang or Python or uh, COBOL, C, um, HLASM, which is a similar based language. Um, and that's that's my work full time. Awesome. I got, I'll, I'll go after Gerald, uh, I suppose. This is David Nixon. I also work at IBM, of course. And uh, Regular day job is working working in the client centers, doing technology for the client centers, the IBM client centers. Uh, on this on this project, uh, along with uh, Gerald and Sid and 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 and, uh, and a bunch of others, doing just kind of full stack development on this, including the, the Vue.js stuff and backend stuff. Awesome. I'm Chris Stefano. Um, uh, in my day job, I work as a uh, project manager and a business analyst in the Watson Health provider consulting team. So <clears throat> working on uh, delivering uh, analytics, et cetera, to healthcare clients. Um, I grew up as a programmer and on this, uh, on this team, I've worked, you know, doing research and project management and uh, a variety of other tasks. Awesome. Hi, my name is Sebastian and I am on my day job, which is pretty much the same thing that I've, I'm doing for Five Fits Voter. I am senior designer in account-based industries marketing, and my day-to-day -day is um, creating assets that are client-facing, and it really helps tell the human story behind the technologies that we offer. Thank you. And that's Sebastian right there, just you know, kind of circling that. And I think we got everyone on the call. Um, and I'm Sabine. I'm not on this list, but I, I serve as kind of the product manager, product manager for you know all the solutions for call for co racial justice. So ensuring that the team's um, you know hard work and the solutions that um, they produce is available to um, the developer community as a whole, and um, as well as you know organizations that will be on the receiving end of these solutions. So I'm handing this back over um, to uh, Alexandria to you know talk a little bit more about like what Five Fifths is, um, you know how it works, and then you know kind of going through that process. So Alexandria, um, take it away. So um, why Five Fifths? So I, I believe it, it. I really like this um, demonstration of it, especially with the hand, because in many ways with the hand, it's kind of like we want to stop and say stop to the uh, the perpetual you know um, systemic racism and bias that's been a part of uh, a lot of part of human interaction in general but particularly in the voting um, space as well as five fifths equals a whole um, from the standpoint of each and every person being able to have uh, an equal opportunity to exercise their voting rights um, as you can see to the right there are several issues, voter suppression. I know we've all heard gerrymandering, uh, you know, felony, uh, you know, if you've been accused of a felony or if you've been charged or convicted of a felony, <laughs> rather, you know, a lot of people don't know what exactly their rights and capabilities are. Um, and what we want to do again is be able to bridge that divide and be able to create uh, more opportunity in the community. Um, voter purging, another major issue. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in the following slide, but um, really making sure that we have, we provide all the tools necessary for individuals to be able to bridge those gaps. Um, and you, you, you'd imagine that being in 2021, that a lot of these things would be uh, solved and rectified. And we'll again talk later uh, more about it in the timeline, seeing how uh, the voting capabilities have grown and maybe not grown so much over time. So we really want to uh, get a strong hold on that. We want to do it in a different type of way. So five fifths, um, again, I believe is, is great because of uh, the, the wide amalgam of people that came together to make it are so different and have so many amazing skills and talents to bring to the table and can relate um, to the people that we're uh, reaching out to as well as the fact that um, 
you know, we really want to create, differentiate ourselves in the way, in the way that we approach this by leveraging the technology that we have. I mean, we are an IBM, um, it is an open solution, but there are all these skills that are at our, within our hands, literally. And we want to be able to use it to revolutionize the voting experience, to be able to make it more personable, make it personal to each individual, because it ultimately is each individual's decision and media can be very influential and friends and family can be very influential, um, positively or negatively. So we really uh, want to be able to create an opportunity for people to have an interactive and accessible experience that is very much um, and I think it also is great, especially just even thinking about the name like Five Fist Voter, it really kind of touches back on, um, you know, uh, African Americans not being, you know, even considered like full beings to have a vote, to own RAM. And, you know, that's like the two fifths rule that, you know, folks want to um, be able to look that up where you only kind of consider two fifths of a person. And so, again, the five fifths equaling a whole, it could have been, you know, 10 out of 10, you're still a whole, but really around, you um, Kind of some of the historical implications, um, I think, for what was you know considered humanity uh, to own right. um, land, to cast a vote, um, to be you know self sufficient in your own person, um, being able to capture that um, in that five fifths name, I think, is really impactful. So absolutely. Um, and sorry, I actually forgot to mention that that was actually one of the, one of the main um, motivations before we saw these other additional additional implications. Um, and really kind of piggybacking off of that, uh, the three E's. So, um, you know, those are the pillars that, that we have um, that represent what our goals are um, in this, with this solution. Uh, the education piece, again, really goes back to, uh, I mean, the ridiculously high numbers of voter purging, the voter suppression in the forms of um, just not having that knowledge and not knowing when when voting registration ends because some states are, are very strict and if you miss it you miss your opportunity you know or not knowing uh, how how you register not knowing if you're already registered not knowing about early voting capabilities and I will preach this because I have preached this every single time I've talked about you know the solution is that I mean I can say as a testament myself I had never voted early before and because of our solution, I was able to seamlessly, not even, not even just vote early, but seamlessly vote early 10, 15 minutes for both of the races that you know I was able to vote for. So just being able to have that knowledge, and knowledge really is power, and that's definitely the first key thing is, is knowing what's out there and, and having the awareness. Um, the empowerment piece is, is really taking a step forward from that and um, again, creating a community and creating unity uh, throughout this process. And the empowerment sometimes is the next step from knowledge because once you know what's at your disposal, you realize how much power you do have. And I think we all definitely saw the last year, um, the power in numbers and the power in people acknowledging you know, their value and acknowledging um, the influence that voting ha can have over your individual life and collective lives. So empowering people in, in multiple ways, we really want to be able to do that through our platform by keeping individuals educated and informed as well as connected and um, and also being, uh, being able to uh, have certain specifications for their particular situation so that they don't feel as though they're just a number and that they are an actual um, person that has meaning. Um, enablement, um, again, so a couple of things that we've done to be actionable um, is create avenues, not just in, in do enablement by showing people how they can register and if they're registered, um, but taking that step forward and showing them where they will go um, based on their particular situation, which is why uh, another reason why personalization we think is very important because um, they can see where they are and based on, you know, their capabilities that they want to drive, if they want to take Uber, Lyft, if they want to, however they would like to get there. We show different ways to be able to get to these locations. Um, we are also connected with showing um, what some of the regulations are within certain states and that's going to continue to build in certain jurisdictions. 
Um, and we also are, are looking to, to build even more so the enablement for those who may be disabled in certain ways. Um, again, for those who may have been convicted of felonies and things of that nature that are not quite aware that may have certain additional things they need to do to be able to, to vote, um, even if they're not aware that they can. So the enablement really is, is, is extensive and, and I really, um, and we as a team are, are really uh, adamant about really using this technology, using these coding capabilities to be able to bring um, as, many, as, many, as much of a wealth of knowledge and capability to our project. And that just rolls into why voting is important. Uh, voting you know, is your voice. It's your choice, your right, and your power. And again, it's very individual, but it's also very much uh, a community um, engagement as well. And for us to be able to come together and focus on our similarities of need and the similarities of need and attacking those together, rather than focalizing on silos and the differences, it enables us to uh, see how we can be able to impact our future. Awesome. Um, so we're going to actually go into a demo of the um, By This Builder site. And I am, okay, now I can stop sharing my screen because I know that Sebastian is actually going to walk us through this as our wonderful um, designer, uh, to, you know, to give us the, the hands-on experience so you all can see what the solution does. Great. Give me one second while I'm pulling it up. Great, we are. And I would like to actually just, uh, so this is the landing page. And I really would like to point you all to this countdown clock. As the team were, and I were working on the design and the UX UI of this, what was something we could have very upfront to show this sense of urgency, this sense of need to have an action be committed and done. So we actually had a, a countdown clock to the general election of 2020. And it was actually used one more time afterwards for the runoff election in February. And then also now that we are reset the countdown clock to the midterm congressional election. So as the user sc scrolls down, we actually have enlarge our scope and included more uh, disenfranchised folks and community. So there's a wider representation in the imagery. And as the user goes through the website, we have solidly used imagery to really help in reinforce the humanity and why it is so important for everyone to be involved and to vote. So more to come as we talk more in the, in the design process, but now I would like to uh, kick this back to Sabine. Perfect. Um, I'm actually gonna, <laughs> we're doing lots of volleying over here, uh, but you know, you all can see that, you know, the demo site um, right now it's up and it's running, um, but we're going to go a little bit more into the technical details of the solution um, as illustrated by our wonderful tech folks um, on the line and I'll hand it over to David. All right, uh, so this is just a C4 diagram to show kind of the breakdown of the system context. So that part in the middle is us, that blue part in the middle is us. And then this is the things we connect to including some Secretary of State sites, um, vote.org. We pull some JavaScript embedded tools from there and from vote, voting info project, we pull from there. A lot of this stuff we get, especially on the pages where you're looking for the early voting location or your day of polling locations, uh, that comes from the Google Civic API. And then we do have a, a, a little bit, I don't wanna overemphasize what we have for amplitude in terms of uh, statistics. We really just have page visits. Uh, as our statistics that are getting fed back to the amplitude uh, system. So that's the big system. I wanna zoom in on, the, on that box in the middle and that's gonna be on that next slide. So this is the same box in the middle. And so we have a typical uh, three tier website here. So we have our services back in that's a Node Express component that talks to a database. It's cloud on the IBM cloud. Um, the only thing we write right now to the database is some cache data. Uh, for instance, when we get 
uh, polling locations from Secretary of State sites uh, that will go into that cache database. So, we, so we're not trying to pull it or scrape it every time. Um, and that backend service is also what talks to the Google Civic API to pull in what the current elections are. And you can see that on the site, it'll list the current upcoming elections. There's three elections today, actually. There's one in Michigan and uh, Utah and uh, Oklahoma. Um, so it's a good thing we do this TV show on a Tuesday because that's typically when we see those dates. So, but those three elections are listed on this on the site and you can choose between those when you're trying to find your polling location. And we get that information from the Google Civic uh, information. Yeah, and I really want to kind of tie this back to, you know, kind of some of my natural like questioning thoughts and what some other folks may be thinking, well, if these are the sites that you're currently using to pull the information, why can't I just go there? Um, if, again, we're talking about accessibility for communities that don't even know that these things exist, you know, what happens if I go to, you know, my local, you know, grassroots organization or civic engagement organization and they point me to this tool, they don't have to send me to, you know, three different sites. Um, or even like one side to say, all right, these are the instructions for you to how to vote um, within your within your state. You can really kind of come here and it, you know, will point you in the right direction without having to navigate, you know, all of these different places. Um, so I think that that's also why um, we're trying to show that we're able to make those connections across a myriad of um, places that host that information and putting it in a single location so it's more accessible to folks who maybe don't know these other places exist, um, you know, can have a little bit more time to understand, you know, the context and the, the ways in which they can vote. And so this is just, you know, supposed to be like a central place that they can access um, as part of their voter journey. So just wanted to say that, yeah, we're pulling from lots of places and information where folks probably wouldn't, you know, access it in their normal lives to understand, you know, how and where to vote. So I'm um, just doing that random plug, but um, handing it back over to you. Should I move to the next slide, David? Uh, let me just cover the last couple here, but it, that is great context. I mean, I appreciate that context because that is, that's, that's our goal. So, um, okay, just on the on the UI, it's it's the it's that piece of it is one that's pulling in the embedded tools from these other places and also doing the reporting out to, to Amplitude uh, for our, our minimal statistics that we keep there. Uh, and then the next slide is just uh, the same system, but in a from a deployment point of view. So we are deployed as a Cloud Foundry app on the IBM Cloud. Um, so there's the, the three tiers you can see there. There's the service tier in the middle here with, that is a Node.js container. Uh, that, there's actually two pieces to that. 99% um, of what we do on the services end is Node.js. The Twitter stuff uh, that we do is from a Python, a piece of Python code that we have. So that's the services in the middle. Uh, and then the web uh, 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 site talks to that services through a proxy, uh, and that's the reporting out. So we get, uh, you know, we report out to Amplitude, and the, the back end is fed by all these different services, uh, some from the IBM Cloud, some from elsewhere. So we have, a, we have the, the Google Civic, Civic API as a service, um, uh, the, uh, the Cloud as a service coming into the back end, uh, the Twitter uh, services is coming in from the back end through this. Uh, as well as the natural language processing, which is part of the Twitter, Twitter code and the, the tone analyzer, which we also use with the Twitter code. So that's the deployment. That's the top level deployment on, on the IBM cloud. I think that's the last slide for me. Oh, no, sorry, there's one more for me. <laughs> so we do have a, 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 a pipeline that, that gets executed um, when changes are made to the site and um, I don't think Gerald is going to be able to demo that today. So I, I'll probably kick off the build during the call here and we'll show the pipeline in progress. Um, but basically it's, it's exactly what you expect. There's a little bit of a test uh, stage in the pipeline that, that, that checks the code before it uh, uh, actually does any deployment. There's a build for the UI and that produces the, uh, we use an uh, Nginx uh, web server as a front end and that build builds the, uh, the Vue.js into something that uh, uh, Nginx can use. And then there's a build for the, there's a deploy for the services and deploy for the UI. Uh, so those, those all run in, in sequence there. Awesome. And I think that, um, Gerald, I'm crossing my fingers that you are good to go. I mean, it's, it's one of those days where it's just like when you're called on, like yes, your computer uh, I, shuts down. <laughs> I, I'm good to go. 
Okay, okay, perfect. So I'll stop sharing so that we can do a live walkthrough. You all are going to see some magic happen um, live. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain just how magic it is in a second. <laughs> First, I want to know, where was I when they were handing out the call for code t-shirts, Gerald? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was I, I'm involved with multiple calls for code things. This shirt came from a previous one. Okay. <laughs> but it, it was the right shirt to wear today. Um, so I'm hoping you can see my screen because I can't see what you can see. Yes, we can see it. All right, great. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm about to show you. So um, this is the GitHub call for code for racial justice five foot voter. Um, I actually had to start from scratch this morning, so this is this is absolutely as live as you can get. Um, and what what I actually had to do was I had to come through here, find the getting started document. Um, figure out how I'm going to contribute and everything. Uh, we have all this great information about how to start uh, video architecture, all the things that we just talked about, uh, as well as links to understand all the open the source technology that we use everywhere, the IBM technology we're using and how we're using it, um, and all of that. And I actually had to kind of start from scratch here because this is my personal machine. Um, my work machine became unavailable today. Um, so. I came in, I was like, okay, great. I'm gonna do some work in uh, VS code. Uh, I came to this page for getting started. I literally followed these steps. I installed Yarn and Python 3 and Docker. Um, and I was like, okay, I have a certificate of origin and I'm gonna do project setup. And so this is where I am. Um, I came in, I did the project setup. Uh, I attached to the, the GitHub at Five Fifths Voter. Um, and was able to put, pull down the code in GitHub. I followed the instructions to create this env file. I am not sharing my keys here in case you were wondering. These are not my keys. I have actual keys, but I, I didn't want to share them on the video so other people wouldn't be using them as they're my personal development keys. Um, but really, I wanted to be able to show um, the development process. So if you look here in the developers, I, I'm not joking. All of this was literally starting from scratch. Um, I had to do the yarn install. Uh, the set up the services, uh, build Docker for the first time, um, set up my nodes and everything. And I, I did this all at the beginning of this call. So if you're wondering how long it takes to get set up and running, this started as this call started at one o'clock. Um, and I'm up and running now. I actually have my uh, own instance here up and running, five fifths voter. You can see it's running on my local hosts. Everything is here. It's all running. If I want to make a change, I can make a change and push it up. Um, but I actually, for, for the few minutes that I, I have you today, um, I, I wanted to actually kind of go through a little bit of the source code um, and, and kind of what um, David was talking about at a kind of code level. Um, and so you can kind of see, um, you know, we have these services. And I'll talk about the services first. Uh, we have um, mock data here. Um, that, that we provide. I can use these to do my testing. Um, I, I have the ballot returns, the early voting. Um, and really, everything I need to do to kind of run the services in the back end. Um, you can see that the services JS file um, kind of sets up these constants, and, and we have the APIs here and can test them. Um, and, and so I can come through, uh, I can look at the Twitter. Uh, so the Twitter, um, we're actually using Tweepy for the kind of Twitter interface. Uh, we're using the Watson uh, natural language understanding. Um, we have, you know, the import the features for sentiment options and emotions and, and some of these concepts. And all of the code is right here. Um, so there, there's nothing hidden. Um, everything is open. You can see exactly what we're doing for the language APIs. Um, you can see here, here's how we're using the call tone analyzer. We do the tone analysis, we pass the tweet through the analysis, um, and we create our results table. Uh, if you're interested in how we do the things for the UI, um, all the UI is here. Um, and so let me see if I can go to one specific component. Uh, so you can see the UI actually, uh, we have a UI for the tweets uh, and how we handle the Twitter, the page views, um, and it, it's all using the uh, carbon and view uh, level of view, uh, and you can kind of see 
the different ones that we're pulling in by default and how we mount those. Um, and, and it's all packaged up and, and we, we use Docker files, right? So none of, the, none of this is hidden anywhere. You can see each activity as it happens, as I build through Yarn, um, you can see it creates the Docker instance. Uh, let me pull over. Uh, when I created the database, right? It, it, I have this image over here. I can see what it's doing. You can see my, my shards and everything. Um, and so as I do my development, I can do all my local development. And then um, when I'm ready, um, I can in, in have somebody do a review. Um, let's see here, I can bring my window back up. <laughs> For some reason, it's not bringing my window back. There we go. Um, you know, I, I can. You can see that. You know, we have our issues out here, um, and you can see that we go through. You go through a pull request, um, and you can see the closed ones. Like there was an update just two days ago that David merged in, um, and you know, we do everything in the open through GitHub. Uh, I encourage everybody to come in and give it a chance, uh, and that's my pitch. I'm going to stop my share and we can continue. Awesome. Thanks so much for that. And also to the point where he said that he was able to spin this up in you know, the amount of time from the beginning of this meeting. Um, I too am taking a uh, Python class. And so I'm hoping eventually I'll be able to you know, start doing these live and say, all right, crash course, um, you know, coding with dummies. I'll be the dummy um, and show folks that it's actually possible um, because they're really the instructions within our GitHub are supposed to be really um, consumable for anyone who has, you know, the, the technology installed to, you know, move through it um, and for it to actually, you know, execute as it's, uh, you know, illustrated. So I'm now going to hand it um, off to Sebastian, who's going to talk about, you know, our design approach um, and giving, again, a little bit more context into, you know, how we're really connecting this to the human um, component and being able to vote and accessibility to voting. Thank you very much, team and Gerald. That was truly inspiring. Uh, I too now will pledge that I will be learning to code. So be ready for all my questions. Absolutely. So, um, sorry, go ahead, please. Oh, just saying, absolutely. Everybody's encouraged. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Sabine, thank you so much to um, for saying the um, the words human centric design. And to really look forward, let's, let's step back a little bit and look at where we were as a nation. So 1776, only Caucasian men, usually Christian and over 21 were allowed to vote. It was up until 1870 that black men was, according to the 50, uh, with the passing of the 15th amendment, uh, was given the right to vote, but that didn't mean that they were allowed to, they could access voting. 1920, women and women suffrage gave women the right to vote, but it was not a universal, especially if you did not have citizenship that meant Asians, that meant Native Americans. In 1924, universal, um, citizenship was granted to Native Americans and therefore giving them the right to vote. But that does not mean that Native Americans were not disenfranchised. As an Asian American, I was beyond shocked that within my father's lifetime, my father was born in 1952. One, it was 1952 that Asian Americans were granted the right to be U.S. citizens and given the right to vote. However, it was up until 1965 that they finally had legislation to say it is against the law and theory to prevent people from voting. So next slide, please, Sabine. Where, 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 where were we in 2020? We still saw record, record amounts of inability to, for blacks and brown communities to access voting. And why was that? But, and this is, and with those insights, 
<clears throat> and pain points is how we actually got to uh, the next slide, please. Our design thinking session, where uh, led by the incredible Sabine, we really reinforce our, <clears throat> our messaging to see who our adopters are, who our citizens are, and of course the development community in our solution for five fifths voter. So next slide, please. Yeah, and also just to kind of touch on this when we're, we're really, again, relating this back to community, we had experts who are focused on, you know, civic engagement, you know, how technology can be used um, for voter enablement to come and give us, again, that kind of external lens that I think, you know, can be lacking um, when we're talking about technology that's supposed to be um, you know, focused on folks who are typically either marginalized. Um, so being able to make that connection is what we're really intent on doing. And I think that that's what Five Fifths Voter is doing so well, is that we know who we're focusing on, folks who don't normally have access to um, information on how to vote. And then, you know, those who are in the technology space, giving us, you know, a little bit more information on what we can do to improve our solution to, again, make accessibility um, more prominent. But then those who are also working deep in those communities and just understanding their problems and what they would actually need to cast their vote, being able to have that inform um, some of the work that we're doing. So again, rounding this out, we didn't just say we have a great idea, let's put all of our assumptions into this and execute it. It was really about being meaningful and purposeful with having conversations with folks that we know have more experience and more expertise than us um, to help us you know, move forward in the right direction. Amazing, thank you, Sabine. And um, of course, we couldn't build a robust product without a real deep understanding of the user demographic, who are we trying to design the solutions to? We definitely had a very thorough examination of the different communities that we were um, solving to. Were, were, was every, questions like, did everybody have the same kind of access to mo mobile devices? Does everybody have the same kind of Wi-Fi access? Does everybody have the same kind of access if you are an ex-convict to some kind of information that you can trust? So we did a very thorough understanding of whom our potential users are, and we use design thinking to map out our personas. So we could, instead of just making blind assumptions, we actually had very educated, um, informed decisions for features informed by specialists in the field as well. And uh, next slide, please, Sabine. And finally, some of the, um, the three main pillars, as you've heard on the top of this call, being education, empowerment and enablement, I wanted to align that with pathos, ethos, and logos. Pathos being um, the emotions and the value that we want to convey to the user. Path uh, ethos being the credibility. Are the sources, are, are we presenting unbiased information? So regardless of whether you vote one color or another, we're presenting to the user very unbiased, fact-checked information. And then finally, logos. Um, what is the reality? What is the reason? And this is really just based on the fact that five bits makes a whole. And we're all whole, um, whole beings participating in a whole community, in a whole global system. And thank you so very much. Back to you, Sabine. Thanks so much, Sebastian. Um, and so kind of moving into uh, kind of the, this is the running pipeline. So the example that Gerald um, so adequately shared, uh, I know that he said he wasn't able to use his current machine to, you know, kind of push that out and then have um, David showcase that. But I know that David wanted to um, show a little extra something before we, you know, open the floor up for questions and, you know, give you all a little bit more information on how to get involved. Um, David, did you want to take over sharing? Uh, sure. So, so Gerald was not able to make a code change, but uh, so we got close. But I just the idea was I was going to show that his code change working its way through the pipeline. So instead, I just pushed something, uh, just a sample change, 
to actually update the README with the, the diagrams that we saw earlier in this chat. So the, the README had, had a version of those. So I updated the, the README and then it, now it's just running through the pipeline. So um, we just wanted to show that running and that's probably it unless there's questions there, but uh, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Sabine. Okay, um, but yeah, y'all are seeing things like the, was it the sausage being made? But sausage is usually kind of gross. So we'll say like the pie being made because everyone yeah. took that pie. <laughs> pie, pie. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, you know, to kind of just like bring things, uh, you know, kind of back to um, what we're saying, this is again, and then, you know, most of our, not even most, but the solution is that we're presenting, especially under call for co social justice, is meant to not be biased among like, you know, political affiliations, political lines, even though we know that sometimes these issues can be politicized, but we are really focused again on how can we address voting issues? Like if you wanna be able to vote, how can we allow, you know, encourage you, empower and enable you to do so? Um, and you can actually find out a lot of information on what is currently happening um, around, you know, voter ID laws, voter suppression, redistricting, redlining um, that really affect, um, typically, you know, black and brown communities um, from casting their votes. And so we're just, again, trying to be able to be that bridge, uh, you know, as an application for, folk, for folks to feel like they can make decisions on their own, they have information and they um, are able to, to move forward in casting their ballot. Um, and so, you know, moving forward, we're still going to continue to make sure that, you know, the basic capabilities of five fifths is working. Um, so, you know, checking if you're registered to vote, um, if you've moved, have you updated um, your address to, you know, update um, your registration. Um, if you have to have different IDs, like, you know, being able to navigate that and being able to um, provide those um, those updates, um, hours and locations of absentee vote drop-offs, and, you know, tons more issues that we have within the GitHub right now. Um, and, you know, and specific roles that we're also going to call out here where we would love to have people from our, you know, the, the community be able to contribute. And if you reach out to us in Slack, I promise we will respond. Um, and, you know, uh, Demi Ajayi, she's not on the call right now, but if she's listening somewhere in the ethers, um, you know, is also really diligent about welcoming folks into call for co racial justice, how you can get started. Um, and then our, our GitHub is also a great place for you to understand first issues um, and where you can, you know, start to, to support. Um, and I'm going to hand this over just to Chris really quickly, who has been, um, you know, really instrumental in helping us, you know, to execute on, on some of the projects that we have upcoming um, and, you know, also illustrating, you know, some of the help that we would like to have um, in the couple months. Thanks, Sabine. <clears throat> Again, I'm Chris Stefano. And um, we are welcoming everyone, anyone who um, is motivated by things you've seen today to get involved in, as it relates to this issue. Um, if you have concern for yourself, your family members, your loved ones, your community, in terms of uh, um, your ability to vote and uh, protecting the right to vote, there's an opportunity for you, regardless of what skills you have, to come and participate. So you can see the list there. Um, certainly technical skills are relevant and user experience skills, um, research skills, data analysis, marketing, project manager, uh, whatever sort of role you, uh, whatever sort of skills you might bring to the table are, are welcome. And, um, I'm, um, and I'm guessing that on the next slide is uh, how to get in touch with us. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So if you have those skills, um, feel free to, you know, take a, you know, pull out your phones and um, follow this, uh, this QR code, join us in the Slack community. Um, you'll be able to also, you know, get started on IBM Cloud with, you know, $200 worth of credit um, in order to, you know, start building out your, your own instances or doing some testing within our solution. Um, and, you know, staying connecting with us and if there are other resources that we can provide for you to um, be brought up to speed around, you know, other technologies that you're interested in or how it can lend itself to, you know, some of the things that we're working on for Five Fist Builder. Uh, we welcome the discussion. Again, we're not trying to make this about just IBM, even though, of course, you see uh, IBM.biz. We really want to be able to be kind of a, a point of access for um, folks all over the globe who want to, you know, learn more about um, these systems, being able to um, provide their technical expertise and advancing what um, justice can look like in these communities. 
um, and essentially just being, you know, another opportunity for folks to um, really, you know, put their heart, as we've seen from this project team, into um, a solution that is actually being adopted. And, you know, plug for this uh, is that we are focused on adoption and we have our, you know, um, you know, some good news coming in the next couple of months around how Five Fifths Voter uh, is going to be able to, to operate at scale within um, a really well-known and really well-respected um, organization around voter engagement and empowerment. So thank you. I think that's um, all the words we got today, Chris. Um, didn't know if there are any additional questions from the chat um, that we wanted to bring up. No additional questions, but I love the teaser. That's that's awesome. I'll be uh, keeping my eye out for that one. But uh, folks, please, if you're interested, get involved. I just dropped the link uh, in the uh, stream chat. If, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me or any Sabine, anybody on this call can kind of help you out, but uh, I greatly appreciate y'all bringing this to OpenShift TV, and I really think this is an important effort, so thank you very much. Um, and yeah. I'm saying thank you to the to the project team. I'm just right. fangirling, um, <laughs> uh, and I appreciate everyone's um, time and effort, um, and excited to grow this up more. You'll be hearing more about uh, what this great solution is doing. Awesome. Can't wait to see more of it. So thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, we'll see you. We're, we're doing another one of these next week, right? Um, in, two, in a week and a half, 14 two days. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> so stick around, folks. Uh, as always, you know, check out the uh, streaming calendar. If you want to be kept uh, up to date on everything, subscribe to it and you'll have that calendar in yours. And uh, until next time, I hope you all stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>